The armies of Daggerfall and Sentinel met in the flowering meadowland of Cringane Field. The tranquil, verdant pastures between both hosts would soon be awash with blood and broken men. The ranks marched to the beat of the drums, and the very soil resonated with the synchronized steps of the advancing battle lines. It was as if the very earth was roused to witness the terrible clash to come. But the rhythm of war was interrupted, as an unnatural fog spread over the field, blinding all combatants. When the mist finally lifted, King Lysandus' body was found, his throat pierced by an unmarked arrow. The Red Guards would later decry this fog as some foul Daedric magical trick, employed by the ignoble Bretons to blind the Red Guard army and check their momentum. But in truth, this unnatural phenomenon was the work of a mighty dragon. Now was not the time to mourn the fallen king. Young Prince Gofrid, who had shown great bravery in battle, and was very popular among the troops, was crowned King of Daggerfall just behind the battle lines, and he ordered the army onward, and the new King Gofrid's Bretons collided with King Cameron's Red Guards, in the newly cleared air, at the decisive Battle of Cringane Field. Hey guys, it's Drew here and welcome back to Fudge Muppet. The Battle of Cringane Field was the final battle in the bloody War of Bettany, but this was no ordinary war. The mysterious fog, the slain king of Daggerfall, this war hardly went according to plan. The War of Bettany is a story of deception, lust and treachery, of secrecy and revenge, and by the end of this video you'll know the full story of this controversial conflict. So let's start with the catalyst for this clash. Why did the Red Guard King Cameron of Sentinel declare war on King Lysandus of Daggerfall? In one word, the answer is piracy. But of course, it's not nearly that simple. No coastal settlement is free from piracy, and Viking is especially prevalent on Tamriel's western coastlines. The Isle of Bettany, located a short voyage from the wealthy region of Daggerfall, is the perfect raiding target. It's perfectly situated at the mouth of the Iliac Bay, and it's a rather prosperous fishing island. So much affluence in such a small isle draws brigands like moths to the flame and Lord Mogruff of Bettany experienced this inconvenience for the length of his tenure. Eventually, the pirate menace was so overwhelming that he sought out the aid of the powerful kingdom of Daggerfall. The formerly independent Isle of Bettany was willing to sacrifice its sovereignty for the might of King Lysandus. Lysandus agreed to be Bettany's new liege lord, despite the knowledge that protecting his new holding would cost a lot of gold and manpower. When word of this agreement reached the Iliac Bay's southern shore, King Cameron of Sentinel was not pleased. Cameron and his advisers believed Betney to be a part of the Kingdom of Sentinel. Their proof came in the form of a 200-year-old contract, which suggested that Betney was a traditional holding of Sentinel. King Cameron declared war on the Kingdom of Daggerfall, and the War of Betney officially began. This war was not supported by everyone. Influential players in both Sentinel and Daggerfall counseled against it. In Sentinel, the Oracle foresaw death and defeat in the war, but in Redguard culture, this kind of pessimism was not welcome. This Oracle was Cameron's chief counsellor, but he was also surrounded by many warlords, who were all eager for glory and new holdings. So her wisdom was stifled, and she was banished from court. In Daggerfall, Lysandus also got an earful from his closest female advisors. Lysandus' Dereni mistress, the court sorcerer Medora Dereni, augured doom and despair in this battle, while Lysandus' mother, the former queen and renowned mystic Nulfaga, foresaw her son's death. But the wheels were already in motion, and the armies were mobilizing. The first major battle of the War of Betney took place in the bay. The Battle of the Bluff saw the opposing navies duke it out on the high seas, but the Breton fleet, under the leadership of the decorated Lord Bridwell, proved superior, and the first blow landed on King Cameron. Soon after the armies fought in the foothills of Glenpoint, and once again the Bretons came out on top. These early stages of the war were not looking promising for the Red Guards. To make matters worse, the decision by King Lysandus to employ mercenary nightblades on the battlefield was paying dividends. A warlord of Sentinel named Carver was gravely wounded by a fireball spell cast by a Dunmary Nightblade. The next major engagement came in the form of the Siege of Craghold. Once again, Lord Bridwell led the forces of Daggerfall alongside King Lysandus and the Crown Prince Gofrid. 
The island of Craghold was surrounded by the remainder of Sentinel's fleet for only a few days before Lysandus, Goffred, and Bridwell broke the siege and relieved the defending garrison. At this point, only the most fanatical warlords in Sentinel still truly felt there was a chance of victory. There had been three significant battles, and Daggerfall had won them all. Morale was at an all-time high in the Kingdom of Daggerfall, for Sentinel surrender was perhaps only one battle away. But it seems there was discord in the most unlikely of places, in King Lysandus' own court. The king's mother, the mystic Norfaga, was still certain that the War of Bethany would end in disaster, but even his mother's divination could not shake Lysandus' confidence. He was yet to suffer a serious defeat, and he was poised to win the war by the sword, reminding King Cameron of his place. Norfaga left Lysandus' court and retired to her castle in the Rothgarian Mountains, leaving her trusted dragon Skakmat to remain in court and send her reports. However, the king's dogged determination was called into question again in Norfaga's absence, this time by his court wizard Medora, whom the king was quite fond of. The pressure from two of his closest advisors caused him to reconsider. Lysandus attempted to negotiate with King Cameron on neutral ground, at Reich Gradkeep. You'd think Cameron's options were limited at this meeting. The extension of an olive branch was a way for Sentinel's monarch to avoid the shame of defeat on the battlefield. But diplomacy is often more unpredictable than battle, and negotiations swiftly fell apart. What exactly happened at Reich Gradkeep is the subject of debate to the present day. Unsurprisingly, both Breton and Redguard accounts of the meeting paint a drastically different picture of proceedings. The text titled, The War of Bethany, is one source of information, and while it is generally a reliable source, it is undoubtedly biased in favour of Daggerfall. The author refers to Hammerfell as a traditionally bellicose country, and infers that Cameron should have listened to his oracle when she predicted Sentinel's defeat. The War of Bethany's account of the negotiations goes as follows. The Treaty of Right Gradkeep was never to be. King Cameron was initially civil, as the losing side of a war is often civil. But when he realised that the proposed treaty would have included a formal declaration that the kingdoms of Sentinel and Daggerfall would share Bethany, he flew into a rage, with no thought for the protocol of attacking a neutral peaceable lordship. Cameron ordered his army to riot through Right Gradkeep. First the halls of the palace, and then the streets of the capital ran red with blood. It was only with the support of the Daggerfall army that the chaos was brought under relative control. The Sentinel army fled to Yerf Burland, and the Daggerfall army chased them as far as the Ravenian forest before making camp. Redguard warrior culture does not automatically mean that Redguards are incapable of civility, as this text suggests. And if we look rationally at the circumstances, shared custody of Betney would have been quite the positive outcome for the Kingdom of Sentinel. The notion that the forces of Daggerfall were flawless peacekeepers, who did absolutely nothing to provoke the hostilities also seems a bit dubious. An opposing source with the same title, only written by a citizen of Sentinel, proposes a rather different series of events. The ill-fated Treaty of Gradkeep began civilly. The terms of peace were discussed, agreed on, and set to paper. The terms were excessively generous. Cameron had agreed to give up some of his rights to Bethany in order to placate the madness of Lysandus and bring peace back to the Iliac Bay. It was not until King Cameron read the treaty he was about to sign that he realised the outrageous perfidy of the Bretons. The treaty had actually been purposefully miswritten by the Daggerfall scribe in a desperate and ignominious attempt to trick Cameron into signing a contract, different from the one to which he had agreed. The castle of Reich Gradkeep erupted into bloodbath, and the war continued. This source is obviously not free from bias either, calling the division of Betney between both parties excessively generous on Cameron's part is ludicrous given the circumstances, and the writer makes no attempt to hide his disdain for the Bretons, all throughout the source. The more neutral Daggerfall Chronicles offers a more reasonable explanation for the breakdown in negotiations. It was initially civil, but the Daggerfall priest Vanek considered Betany to be the holy land of Kinnereth, who is the goddess protector of Daggerfall. He saw giving up the land as blasphemy. When an agreement was reached, in which Sentinel and Daggerfall were to be joint lieges of Betney, Vanek substituted a fake treaty designed to offend Lysandus. Lord Bridwell, according to legend, shattered the treaty and its writing table with his battle axe, and the room descended into chaos. Cameron discovered the priest's treachery and slew him. Lord and Lady Graddock, the sovereigns of Rygradkeep, 
attempted to restore order, but to no avail. The palace became soaked in blood. They, along with the heir, Lady Mara, were among the casualties. The town was devastated due to the battle and the ensuing looters. In time, the generals took control of their respective armies. Daggerfall retired to camp in the Ravenian forest. Sentinel and Yarf Burrowland. The flowering meadowland of the Kringain field separated them. Simply put, whichever source or combination of sources you choose to believe, the outcome remains the same. The rift between Daggerfall and Sentinel was wider than ever. Both leaders were now desperate to eradicate the opposition and emerge victorious. And the only thing separating the respective monarchs from ultimate glory was Kringain Field. King Lysandus now found himself one battle away from winning the War of Betni. It should have been simple. All he needed to do was meet with his generals and plan a strategy. But the Battle of Kringain Field would not unfold like a regular battle. You may remember me mentioning Daggerfall's court wizard, Medora Dereni. She, along with Lysandus' mother, advised the king not to go to war with the Red Guards, and Lysandus took her counsel very seriously. That's because Medora was more than a court wizard to the king. She was also his lover. Lysandus was a married man, but historically that's rarely an obstacle for royalty. While Lysandus was away at war, the queen, Minisera, discovered evidence of the affair, and Medora was banished from the kingdom of Daggerfall. She returned to the Isle of Balfiera and wrote a letter to Lysandus. Lysandus responded, and we have a fragment of this burnt letter written in his own hand. It reads, shall abandon my responsibilities, you and together, the rest of the world be damned. Let me put this betony behind. I shall crush them at Kringain, during, dead. No one will suspect that a king would give up. This is all that was salvageable from the letter, but it is clear that Lysandus was willing to give up his life as a monarch, to pursue a life with his mistress. And this is where things get confusing. When the armies took to the field, Skakmat, Norfaga's dragon, cloaked the land in a dense, unnatural fog. And when it cleared, the king lay dead, an arrow in his neck, or perhaps in his heart, depending on the source. Was that King Lysandus, or was it some sorry soul made to wear the king's livery? If we listen to a Red Guard's take on what happened, you'll hear that the sure arm of a sentinel archer struck him in the throat, even through the thick, swirling fog. But I find that unlikely, given that one sentence earlier, the very same Red Guard said that the sentinel army was blinded by a wall of mist. Even Breton accounts of the battle assume it was the true king who was killed. But that's because only a few important figures were privy to Lysandus' scheme. The king was not ambitious. He cared not for glory. That much is clear from his willingness to negotiate with an almost beaten foe. So what happened on that night before battle? Lysandus involved his son in the plan, as Gofrid was ready to step up to the responsibility of leading Daggerfall. But there was another party involved as well. A small delegation led by Lord Woodbourne came from Wayrest on the eve of battle. One account says that Lysander switched clothes with a petty noble of Wayrest and boarded a ship bound for Balfiera. Then Woodbourne sent the Orcish warlord Gortwog to slay the king. An opposing account claims that Lord Woodbourne stuck a dagger between Lysandus' ribs on that very night. It is rumoured that Gofrid was in on this conspiracy, but why would he need to murder his father when Lysandus was handing him the throne anyway? And surely no assassin could get so close to the king when the entire might of Daggerfall's army was present. It seems much more likely to me that Gofrid would use an impersonator to feign his father's death on the battlefield. And for Gofrid to continue with the original plan, it makes sense that Lysandus would have been assassinated after departing from the safety of his camp. But just like the misty field of Kringain, the night before the battle was shrouded in mystery and misinformation, and the treacherous potential of power-hungry nobles is anything but predictable. Lysandus would not be avenged for two years. Gofrid, whether he was unaware of his father's demise or not, executed the plan, and when Skakmat's mist cleared, young Prince Gofrid, who had shown great bravery in battle and was very popular among the troops, was crowned King of Daggerfall just behind the battle lines, and he ordered the army onward. Despite a precarious start, the tide of battle turned in Daggerfall's favour, as it so often had in this war. King Gofrid met King Cameron in the heat of battle, and the two monarchs duelled. It was a close fight between two expert swordsmen, but it was the new King Gofrid who emerged victorious. Lord Aram of Sentinel formally surrendered, and the War of Betany was won. 
the isle officially became the undisputed territory of the Kingdom of Daggerfall, and in an attempt to keep the peace, Gofrid married the late King Cameron's only daughter. There was peace at last, though not for the betrayed king. A year after the war's conclusion, in Third Era 404, the restless spirit of Lysandus haunted the streets of Daggerfall, with a legion of ghosts in tow. It fell upon an Imperial operative, known only as the Agent, to bring the tormented soul closure. When the Agent located Lysandus' crypt, the late King uttered through cold dead lips, I do not seek to be placated, I seek vengeance upon he who slew me. If you'll truly lay my spirit to rest, be the instrument of my vengeance against Lord Woodbourne of Wayrest. Woodbourne confessed to the crime before attacking the Agent, and when beaten, the fallen Lord says, I am done in, it is up to, to Gofrid now, may you rot in hell, I most certainly shall. With his dying words, Woodbourne claims Gofrid was his co-conspirator, and in his diary, we learn that Gortwog the Orc was not involved in Lysandus' death. We also learn that Woodbourne coveted the throne of Wayrest, and Gofrid was in fact allied with Woodbourne. Perhaps after all, Lysandus had been stabbed by Lord Woodbourne in front of Prince Gofrid. Or maybe Gofrid shot his father with an arrow when the fog cleared from Kringane Field. Whatever the case, Woodbourne's death was enough to give the King's spirit closure. King Lysandus is at last able to rest. The wraiths and ghosts of his loyal soldiers vanish as his soul passes to the underworld, leaving the city of Daggerfall to the living. And there you have it guys, the War of Bethany and the Betrayed King. There is an old joke about the Bretons of High Rock that says, find a new hill, become a king. And this culture of countless rival lords, desperately seeking to control more land, is what leads us to events like the War of Bethany. The Bretons managed to turn a series of glorious triumphs on the battlefield into a tangled mass of court intrigue, scandalous affairs, and patricidal conspiracies. I hope you enjoyed the video guys, thanks so much for watching. I've been Drew, this has been Fudge Muppet, and I'll see you in the next one.